Imagine this was an everyday event. The thing was just like that. For Abdi Jama, it is. Coming the other way. They would show up. This man risked everything to become a wildlife filmmaker. He gave up his home in America and returned to Africa. This film follows what happened next. My name is Abdi Jama. I am Somali. I come from a long line of storytellers. I have come back to Africa to tell my story. Abdi Jama's had an extraordinary life. Born in Somalia, he found his way to America and spent 20 years working his way to the top as a businessman. But a visit to the Denver Zoo changed his life. He saw the animals he knew from his childhood and decided he had to return to Africa. He wanted to become a storyteller using film as his medium. Abdi took a short film course, bought a camera, a plane ticket and said goodbye to America. When Abdi was a boy, his instincts about wild animals were strong. They helped him to survive. Now he had to find a way to remember. Not to mention, learn how to use his camera. This film is about the amazing events that unfold in front of Abdi's camera. He's made a good decision to come to the Maremi Game Reserve in Botswana but he's made a bad decision to pitch his camp right in the middle of the lion's territory. Abdi's discovered that lions rule in their territories, which means they do pretty much what they want. This is just the beginning. As long as Abdi stays camped in this spot, it'll get turned over regularly by the lions to inspect their new visitor. Safari guides named the pride leaders. There's Lazy Boy and Patches, just as active as his brother. Both are mature males. They've ruled the pride for the past seven years. Life is good. They're in charge. Abdi's instinct is to become part of the pride himself, and his first two months, he works at being accepted. Once the lions do accept him, there seems to be no limit to the activities Abdi gets to film. Abdi believes the real key to his success with the pride is patience and respect. As the weeks pass, Abdi gets plenty of camera practice and he makes getting close to the lions look easy. But he's taking a big risk to get this shot. Abdi instinctively knows when to leave the lions alone. If they decide he's a threat, they could turn on him, which could make Abdi's new career a short one. Spending every day filming the pride, he captures the tiniest detail, like Patches injuring his paw in this pride scuffle. And instinct tells Abdi that he's safe. For the time being, at least, the lions seem to cooperate and he films everything he can. Patches is still bothered by his sore paw. And for now, the rest of the pride wow. takes things easy. As the weeks pass, the life of the pride begins to unfold in front of Abdi's ever-present lens. He captures the younger lions on film as they learn to defend their territory. They start out with the small stuff, a young black-backed jackal. To the lions, he's a threat and must be eliminated. The jackal's not food, it's just not welcome. One reason that this place attracts so much wildlife is because the Okavango Delta floods twice a year. 
Each time the plains and woodland are transformed into a food and wildlife bonanza, and Abdi's working at getting it all on film. It's still early in his first year back in Africa, but he's made a good start with a valuable archive of lion footage already in the can. But Abdi needs a new challenge for his unique brand of filming. He gets it. This leopard mother is up there already, and all of a sudden I see the impala come in to feed on the berries that are on the ground. And I'm saying, my goodness, what's about to happen? Is she going to bounce on those impala from that height? Abdi gets into position. He's never had an opportunity to prove himself like this before, and he'll only have one shot. He cuts it fine, but finds his frame. Yeah, and I, I really, really excited. I was so excited. I, I, I was nervous. I was shaking. <laughs> you can see the, the movement of, my, of the camera I got. So she's getting ready. Um, uh, look, 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 look. Holy moly, holy leader. Oh, I can't believe it. That's really something. That is really something. But just when things could scarcely get more exciting for Abdi, something else happens. She bounces from up high, nearly seven meters on an impala ram, but neither of us was prepared for what was about to happen. Abdi whip pans across to find patches. That injured paw has slowed him down, but he's seen the leopard hit the impala and moves in for an easy meal. <coughs> Patches checks out the leopard. She's bolted up the tree out of his way, no match even for a lame lion. And Patches makes the final spectacular kill on the injured impala. For the leopard, this kind of thing goes with the territory, lion territory. And while Patches walks away with his free meal, Abdi realizes he's just found his next story. Patches steals the leopard's prey, but the leopard is about to steal the picture. I got to know that leopard mom, I call her Ebla, a Somali name, it is without blemish. She is absolutely perfect. And what a break for Abdi. He knows how difficult it is to see a leopard, especially in the day, which is the only time he can film. He's not about to let her get out of his sight. That's beautiful. 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 Abdi cut his filming teeth on the lion pride. He worked long and hard getting them used to him, and now it's the leopard's turn to get to know Abdi. The lions still feature in his dailies, usually when they're patrolling their territory for intruders. But Ebla's a skilled climber, and while the pride lives their life at ground level, she can find sanctuary up above them. But even up here, Ebla is the focus of Abdi's attention. It's three months later. Abdi has lost the trail of Ebla the leopard, but he's still keeping himself busy. I got to start early in the morning. Be on my way to... Abdi took his last late wake-up call in Denver. Wildlife filmmakers have to get up early. And each day begins with some essential, if simple, camera checks. Yeah, this is my old, very old, trusty Ari S. 48 years old, older than me. But works. Very heavy. It's time to go. At least he can travel light. Abdi's only lens is a standard zoom, and the first time he looked through the viewfinder, he realized just how close he was going to have to get. But while Abdi's days start very early, Africa's number one predator, the king of beasts, keeps to a strict routine of inactivity. However, there's always someone else to film. The resident bull elephants don't mind the sight of Abdi in his truck just yards away. But a breeding herd is a whole new ball game, and they make it perfectly clear to Abdi that they wish he'd stayed in Denver. The herds migrate through the Okavango during the dry season. Rainfall from the Angolan Highlands floods the delta when their usual watering holes have dried up. The matriarchs run these herds and are incredibly protective of their young calves. 
but Abdi's learned to be patient. He doesn't want to push his luck. The herd will still be here for a while. And leaving the elephants for a while results in a real stroke of luck. Ebla makes a comeback. When Abdi finds her again, she has two young cubs. When I first saw the two cubs, they were not much older than three weeks. As I got to know the two cubs, I could see that the male is the more adventurous. He's always about exploring, going here and there and all over. You see here, he has found a young Taurus and he wants to know what it is. Abdi notices how the female cub has none of her brother's adventurous spirit and is reluctant to stray far from her mother's side. It was always the little guy that she had to worry about. He was the pain in the neck. The little female would always be there at mom's side, always obedient. But he didn't like to be told what to do. So Ebla would be calling him, always going to look for him, and he would be out there somewhere doing his own thing. Abdi feels there are similarities between his own childhood and that of the cubs. His life, like theirs, has always been full of drama. I believe I am the luckiest man in the world, but it has not always been like this. Born into a camel herding family in Somalia, his father left Abdi's mother when he was just months old, and by the time he was eight, he was herding camels for his stepmother's family, who beat him regularly. Everyone told Abdi his mother was dead. He spent his time alone in the wild with the camel herds, living on his wits, and like the leopard, he lived on instinct, climbing trees to escape wild animals. Then one day, a strange woman turned up. She'd walked over 140 miles to find Abdi. That really was a strange sight. And she's coming and say, young man, are you by yourself with these camels? Yes. How come? I don't know. I'm getting a bit annoyed because my camels are really moving and I had, a, I, I had a beating already earlier that day. Listen, you got a mother? I said, no. What do you mean no? Well, I was told my mom died when I was uh, young, a baby. And I'm still saying, but what, what has this got to do with anything? I gotta move. Uh, and she said, listen, your mom is not dead, I'm your mom. His mother made sure he got a proper education. For the first time in his life, he had someone to look after him. It's January, Abdi's first rainy season. The rains mean that he can't move around as he has been, so he leaves the delta until the floods are over. When he does return, the landscape he sees is totally different. It's a spectacular wetland. But some things haven't changed. Lazy Boy is still out on patrol, the beginning of his fifth year at the top. And the younger Pride members are thriving too. Both Lazy Boy and Patches seem to remember who Abdi is, and he gets in close to them to film. Lion prides are social groups ruled by males. Their territories vary in size depending on how much wildlife live in them. Their boundaries are regularly marked and patrolled by the pride as they defend it against intruders. The prides hunt over many square miles and their range may be anywhere between 14 to 400 square miles. Partnerships between two adult males are common and together they defend their pride and territory. These leaders are often born into the same litter, staying together for life. The pride females do most of the work, hunting and sharing the task of bringing up the cubs. The young cubs that Abdi saw when he arrived last year are now precocious young lions. They can't resist their urge to explore their territory while the rest of the pride tackle things with their usual sense of purpose. 
and Abdi follows them, only to find himself witness to another drama as it unfolds. He watches as the cubs encounter another male. He's a stranger, and what's worse, he's younger, bigger, and stronger than Lazy Boy or Patches. The local guides already know about him and have christened him Angus. He's the pride's worst nightmare, an adult male lion in search of a pride and territory of his own, and when he finds one, he'll try to take it. Life may have to change for Abdi's pride. It's the males that are in danger. Angus is preparing to drive them out or even kill them. He can smell the pride, they're nearby. The young lions sense danger. They watch and wait. This would be trouble enough if Angus were alone, but he isn't. Beginning the brutal assault on the pride is Scarface, Angus's accomplice. Abdi's there, camera rolling on the action. Finally, Patches makes a run for it. He's finished as pride leader here and will never return. Scarface parades himself to what is left of the pride, mainly the females. One of the male cubs makes a futile stand against the invaders and is killed. Even the cubs that have fled to the tall marsh grass are run down and killed. This is the way lion prides change hands. It is a brutal and bloody part of nature. The new leaders must start their rule by building a new pride. They turn their attention to the females and stake their claim with scent. The lionesses must now show their loyalty to the victors, conceiving offspring sired by Angus and Scarface. Bushes are marked with scent that acts as a warning to any males still in the area that there has been a change in command. The males that have survived the takeover have to submit to Angus and Scarface. If they don't bow in submission, they will be killed. The lion's roar is one of the most impressive in the animal world. Lazy Boy limps away. This was the last shot Abdi ever got of him. Once the last of the young males has been subdued, it's the female's turn to submit. Abdi is back at square one, the new pride sizing him up. Clearly he's not a threat, but he's not familiar enough to allow too close. He keeps a respectful distance. The new pride settles into the old routine. Working as a team, Angus and Scarface have done the hard work, and now they can take things easy. For Ebla the Leopard, that could mean trouble. They'll be on the lookout for threats to their territory. But when Abdi does find her and the cubs, he's relieved that she's clearly doing okay. They're feeding on a kill. Mom, Ebla, had already got them to eat and eat and eat until the carcass was light enough to get in the tree. But the little guy isn't helping. He is always wants to do things his way. He's showing initiative already. I would say he's like me. I would be let go of my mom's house early in the morning, and I would be gone all day exploring, fighting, kicking, smoking, and stealing. I was cheeky like this fella. 
this guy is doing his own thing. He is impressing mom, but he's only a baby and he doesn't know what he's doing. The female cub is much less trouble. Instead of trying to take charge like her brother, she goes ahead and feeds off the carcass. It's wedged in the tree and Ebler wants to get it on the ground. The female does nothing to help and seems to be too busy eating. But the male's determined to help and Ebla lets him prove that he's got the strength to try. One day the male cub will leave the family to look after a territory of his own and compete with other male leopards. The female will only stray a short distance to find her territory, perhaps even next to her mother's, so she doesn't need that bold streak in the way that he does. The male cub tries hard to outdo his mum. He's had his chance and Ebler has had enough. But he's a male through and through and gives her an impudent swipe back. <coughs> That's a shame. A disgrace, hitting your own man. The female cub seeks reassurance with her mother. Ebla's mother leopard characteristics remind Abdi of how his own mother fought for him. She worked hard to put him through school and encouraged him to make his way to America. So Abdi feels an especially close relationship to Ebla and her wild family. It's anyone's guess what Ebla really makes of Abdi. But whatever it is, she seems content to have him around watching their every move. Abdi even stays to watch them sleep and reflects on his own African boyhood. She said, this is, you know, my son, the only one I got. I, I really like him to learn to read and, and write and uh, I, well, actually learn the Quran. He said, all right, but he looks to be old. He's the a boy, he's, uh, what are we gonna do with him? Uh, is, is he a smoker? No. Is he a thief? No. But I think he will be both if we don't help him, if he doesn't get help. So I just ended up in a, in a public school and then I went on, I got promo promoted to a boarding school. And that's where I met uh, the uh, British and Irish teachers. And man, then I never looked back. Six months have passed and the Delta is flooded again. This time the waters come from the Angolan hills, a hundred miles away gradually working its way here as the surrounding area dries up and attracting huge numbers of game in the process. You know, when I got here, I found out that elephants, uh, breeding herds, do uh, come to this water point to drink and bathe and relax. But uh, when I came on a bit closer to take some shots of them, uh, they would inch away, they would just move away. They knew that there is some kind of stranger coming. It's really amazing how they know a character, a person, a vehicle that they hadn't seen before. So I would come respectfully closer a bit without actually heading for them uh, head on. And then I would see that they would be moving away little by little. They would not let me get close. And then after I just kind of let it go and stay still stay around and enjoy the scene, I see the matriarchs, the older ladies come around and pretend to be feeding close by with their trunks up. I think they were recording my scent for future use, you know, or maybe even visually recording this vehicle. They've never seen it before. So uh, just for future reference to say who is this character, we've never seen him before. Fred or Four. I was convinced that's what they were saying. Abdi works his magic, and the elephants slowly come to trust him. All except for Mary, a powerful matriarch with a collar around her neck, which shows she was once a captive. 
And unfortunately for Abdi, Mary is a senior herd matriarch. The rest follow her lead. If she says the stranger is not to be trusted, Abdi is going to have difficulties getting any filming done. Usually I would hear him coming in the distance, so I would go ahead and situate myself to where I'm not really hindering their the, the way to the, to the water here. So they would come and say, oh, oh, they would confer, especially the younger ones. And they would say, mom, guess what? That character is here. But Abdi's not one to back down. He's determined to get the shot. But little by little, they kind of realize this guy's okay. He's, 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 he's okay, he's with us. And that was uh, sweet, wonderful. The Okavango is certainly not short of spectacular wildlife. There's plenty more for Abdi to film and even more dramatic events to be revealed. After a full year, Abdi now has an established base in the Okavango Delta and is back on familiar ground filming the Pride. Even Angus, the new boss, is getting used to the sight of Abdi in his truck first thing in the morning. Abdi was hit by the filming bug when he was still a boy in Somalia. The US Peace Corps came to town with a mobile movie theater and they gave him his first glimpse of America. They had movies they, on projectors they would show us about. And Montana later saw the big fat cows. Horizons that you absolutely would not see the end of. They say that is Shangri-La, that is heaven, that's where we're to be. And incredibly, Abdi, a Somali camel boy, was given an opportunity that would transform his life college, followed by a master's degree in business administration and a career as an account executive. Uh, it's a different world altogether. And masses and masses and masses of people everywhere. I mean, I've never seen or dream of that volume or number of white people everywhere. <laughs> we just used to have one or two that we could see shining from a distance. I thought everyone I met there was studying for uh, something that has to do with uh, money, banking. For 20 years, he never looked back. He soaked up the lifestyle. This was as different as life could get. Then came that visit to the zoo. Abdi's life was about to change all over again. And he started to see the way he wanted it to go. On regular visits to the zoo, he was drawn to the African animals. Through the lens of a borrowed camera, Abdi saw these creatures from his childhood in a new way. But the zoo was not enough. He wanted to film them in the wild to tell their stories. He did what others only dream of doing. He headed back to the wilderness of Africa. The easy life was over. He started a new chapter armed with just a 48-year-old camera, bags of determination, and an eye for a good story. I came to Africa to actually make a film on, on giraffe. Actually, the name in Somali for giraffe uh, is Giri, the cursed camel. The stories from his childhood also gave him inspiration. In a drug period, many, many years ago, this fine red camel with a lot of milk on it was designated to feed the elders who were praying for rain day in and day out. But the rains never came. And the little grass that it was depending on was getting shorter and shorter and harder to find. Finally, one day, she just happened to see thunder and cloud way, way in the distance and decided to look for fresh grass over there. It broke its fence and walked and walked and never came back. So the elders put a curse on that fine red camel and it became a giraffe, a long-necked creature with a broken pattern on its red skin that we see today, forever roaming the bush country. The curse in the story, the long neck of the giraffe, allows it to feed on the fruit of the sausage tree, a much-loved delicacy and way beyond the reach of anything with a short neck.
But filming these elegant animals, Abdi realizes that their height isn't always an advantage. A giraffe gives birth standing and a newborn calf must drop two meters or so to the ground. This giraffe calf is stillborn and soon attracts Ebla and her cubs. Mother herself risks falling prey to the lion pride. She is in their territory. Preoccupied with this lucky find, the leopard family pays less attention to other newborn giraffes. Able to get to its feet within minutes, a young giraffe must fend for itself from the moment of birth. Mother isn't able to offer much protection. Abdi identifies with the lives of the animals that he films, and by spending so much time with them, he gets wonderful opportunities. The pride, it seems, has already fed. The weakened female giraffe, the one who gave birth to the stillborn baby, was indeed killed. The next morning, Abdi films the conclusion. Into his third year, Abdi has established his everyday routine. Each day begins with the potential for a new story. Suddenly, he sees a young cheetah sprinting through the grass. It's in trouble. Its mother has killed an impala, that's good but she's caught it right in the middle of lion country. That's bad. To a lion, a cheetah is competition for food, and the pride's about to chase her away and steal her prey. Abdi's turned up just in time. The excitement is about to start. But just as the lionesses have driven the cheetah off and grabbed the kill, a brash young male lion from their pride tries to pull rank. He's out to claim the kill himself. The cheetah uses the squabble as covering fire and escapes into the bush. But there's no such thing as a free meal, and the male has to work hard to hang on to the carcass. Another male joins in the chase. But eventually they all give up and let him gorge alone. Abdi's stories include some familiar faces as the lives of different animals overlap. But he's always searching for new characters too. And as he starts to explore more of the delta, he finds them. Folks in these parts tell me there are more people killed by, by hippos than any other mammal. But I believe if you treat them with respect and give them space, they're all right. But Abdi is not about to be deterred. They're big and not that easy going, just like the matriarch elephants. So Abdi decides to approach them the same way. Hippos are clearly not animals one wants to irritate, but as long as they are angry with each other, Abdi is safe. This is also a real scoop for Abdi. Hippos usually fight each other in the water. There's over five tons locked in fierce battle here. These spectacular male brawls are always brutal and often end in death. Their massive teeth can bite and rip into each other's bodies with enough force to tear through hippo hide and disembowel the opponent. The winner is usually the one with the biggest mouth, but these two are the same size and it's a stalemate. Again, Abdi remembers an old Somali folktale about the hippopotamus. The hippos have a way of just getting carried away and moving on and on and on, especially big guys and patriarchs. No fear of lions or anything, they just move. And sometimes it's just totally leave their territory. So this particular guy just could not find his way back to the river. And uh, he was praying, he was crying. Good Lord, I'm hungry, there's no water, I'm bleeding, I'm sweating. First thing I need to ask you for is, I need to eat, I'm hungry. I need, could you just give me a hand or something that I can reach these trees, this vegetation on top of me? You see, that's what I need, good luck. So that came through. So he got elongated, his shape got changed. So today, we see the elephant, when it's hot and high noon, still coming back, finding its way uh, to the river to drink. But still, 
It's no longer a hippo, cannot stay in the river, has to drink and move and go. And so it just tells you, just be careful what you ask for, in case you become that. Don't wish for too much, you, you have it good, Don't have no worry. Unscientific and unconventional, but that's not what Abdi's about. And you have to hand it to Abdi, he's not afraid to do things his way. Even when faced by a herd of young bull elephants, they each weigh over 9,000 pounds. And a single swipe from a trunk could immobilize Abdi and his truck for good. He keeps his cool and keeps rolling. Abdi's put his faith in the unique approach he's developed to filming. It's based entirely on respect. This is not for the faint-hearted. They can be on their own, but just like us, they like company. They get together to drink, talk, brag, fart, and enjoy one another. Some of the talk I can hear with my own human ears. It's not their stomach, like some people would tell me. It's really communication. They are saying, it's time to move. Everybody had enough to drink? I'm moving off on my own guys. And then the older ones will go, and the rest will follow, uh, just like us humans. I believe these creatures can sense and read respect. I believe they see that about me. That's why they haven't killed me a long time ago. One day I was just having lunch, and this magnificent bull elephant by himself, like they usually are, some, you know, was in the bush behind me there feeding. Then he just came a little bit, came, came. So I'm to myself, I'm saying, you, you fool. Why, why, why don't you just come? Come in that open area, that gap between me and right there. Come by, there's the river. And by goodness, he just came towards me slowly. He was coming slowly, slowly. And he had his head sideways, his amber eyes, I could see blinking. He was, he was touching me and was quiet. Door open exactly like this. And uh, he, would, he just came and came and came and came. And he was just moving larger and larger. <laughs> I said, good enough, what, what do I ask for? <laughs> what do I do now? And he comes and comes and comes. And then all of a sudden, he lifts the trunk and he is, he is transacting me. He's looking for food. <laughs> so his trunk is all over the place. And when he breathes, his trunk is almost in my pocket. I'm, I'm here like this. And uh, I'm just saying, he's going to overturn this little a truck, and every time he bruises out my clothing on the seat here, it's literally flying all over the place. <laughs> so he comes around and he is like this. So then I remember it, if you do this, you know, they back off. And that's what I did. And he just kind of backed off, like saying, I, I don't mean any ham, just looking for a snack, man. He just did this, did this, and he just. Stay around me. He didn't really go far. I mean, is that, is that, that's magic, man. I'm telling you, that was magic. Abdi's technique is unique, and he's living proof it works. It's been about four months since Abdi filmed the takeover of the Pride, and he returns to see what's happening. Angus is clearly still in charge. Right on the edge of the territory, hidden by the undergrowth, Abdi spots a pride female with a brand new litter. But these cubs do not belong to Angus or to Scarface. They're lazy boys, conceived just before he was overthrown. Their chances of survival are slim. Not only is Angus a danger, but the border of this territory is the edge of another rival prides. They are not welcome anywhere around here. If Angus finds these cubs, he will instinctively know they are not his, and he'll kill them. She looks anxious. The cubs are only feet away in the bushes and remain still and silent. But luckily, Angus doesn't spot them and passes by their den. 
every day their existence will remain on a knife's edge. The two powerful leaders meet and greet each other in another part of the territory. All she can do for the cubs is to feed them and keep them hidden. Shortly after he filmed them, this outcast family disappears and Abdi is left wondering if the cubs will ever make it. Over the next few months, the Okavango begins to dry out again and lots of new creatures appear. Pray for the pride, but some of them can be lethal. Buffalo are heavyweights and they're dangerous, but there's a lot of meat on a buffalo, so they're high on the target list for lions. Angus is unlikely to make this kill alone, but it's in his character to try. For all their might and power, male lions do very little hunting. It's the lionesses that hunt for the whole pride. Abdi shoots the hunt and captures the extraordinary teamwork. With this particular pride, members have specific skills in tackling an animal this big. Each female has a role to play in the attack. But this youngster at the front is out of line. She's fooling around and really gets to pay for it. And look here. She got caught in the face and we believe she died the next day from that wound. It's not every day they catch an animal this big. This is a feast for them for a few days, depending on how many more of the family find their way here. So when I am filming, I got to be sure I don't interfere to where the buffalo gets away. That would be lack of respect. Abdi has never tried to change the course of nature. He feels that trying to help an injured animal would never be the right thing to do. It's only by being a silent witness to life and death in the Okavango that he's managed to capture such extraordinary behavior on film. After persevering with the migrating elephant herds, the same animals that were avoiding him before are beginning to show signs of trust. Abdi's worked hard for this and explains how he won the herd's acceptance. In this area, I know many of them can recognize who is who from the tusks, from the ears. But as long as I don't misspend that trust I, you know, built up with them over the last few seasons, that I'm respectful when they're drinking, I don't kind of get, you know, head to them, you see? Or where I'm not making too much noise, banging doors, sitting there, doing my own thing, they say it's absolutely no problem. They're saying, bless you, what a guy. This guy is one of us. I really feel they do, they do say that. I would just see them almost every day for three months of the dry season, somewhere along the river. I would anticipate their approach, set up my camera, and just wait patiently for them to arrive to drink. Afterwards, when they got used to me, it was okay for me to drive around. As the herds make the most of the last flood water, Abdi knows that they will soon be leaving the delta. By now, he is able to get right up to them, even to the calves, which are normally so heavily protected by the matriarchs. While the breeding herd leaves the delta, Abdi watches the bulls enjoy the last of the mud. sick old bull, probably a lot older than Abdi, catches his eye. He doesn't look like he'll survive much longer. Abdi's right. A few days later, he comes across the body. The carcass has already attracted the attention of predators looking for an easy meal and the usual scavengers making their living from the dead. Life and death in the wild are nothing new to Abdi. As a boy herding camels, he saw it all the time. Like all wildlife filmmakers, he sees how these stories are a crucial part of nature. 
But he still worries about some of his characters, especially the ones he's got to know so well, like Ebla. After looking in all her favorite trees, he finds a leopard, but it's not Ebla. It's her grown-up male cub, and he's in trouble again. He's testing the theory that lions don't climb trees, and it wasn't a safe bet. The lions don't know they're not supposed to climb. They've smelt the prey that he dragged into the tree to keep it from them, and the leopard is not keen to let them steal it. What Abdi manages to film here is extraordinary. Lions climbing trees for prey are a very rare sight. The lions get to the kill and even fight over it while still up the tree. Yet again, the pride has claimed another free meal. And the young leopard is learning what life in lion country is all about. All the leopard can do is watch the lions have their feast. And then he makes a run for it. He'd best not be around when they finish eating. The lioness gives chase, but she's too slow or too full and can't outrun him. The young male leopard's choice to establish his territory here marks the beginning of a new era in Abdi's search for stories. Abdi returns to the carcass of the old bull elephant, which is about to become the setting of a dramatic standoff between two of Africa's top predators. This is the perfect place to see a story unfold between all the different predators and scavengers. They cannot resist an easy meal like this, and they don't give it up easily. Before you know it, nothing would be left. At the right time, they all give way to crocodiles. It's magic. When they get done, hyenas will come, jackals, sometimes wild dogs, and then vultures will take over. Lions and crocodiles are old and well-established enemies. They compete, they hunt, they scavenge, often for the same prey. The lions bring up reinforcements. It looks like things are going to start happening. The lions are waiting and being cautious. The crocodile is the only predator here that is as powerful as they are. And Abdi's waiting too. Then the lions make a move. Not a full-on attack, but it's enough to send the crocodiles into retreat. And even the lions look surprised by the back down. Abdi chalks up another unique sequence. He leaves the lions to eat their fill over the next few hours and heads off. The new pride really does have total rule here. They have young, strong leaders, and it should be a long time before there is as much drama in their lives again. Abdi has made sure that we have been able to see just how these impressive predators live. After eight months without any sign of Ebla, Abdi finally tracks her down. She appears to be alone. Abdi moves in to get those close, intimate shots that have become his signature and Ebla seems as comfortable as ever to have him around.
Abdi's approach to filming is exceptional. He came here with an instinctive respect for the animals he wanted to film and a style all of his own for telling their stories in a new and refreshing way. The intimate family portrait of Ebla and her cubs, Lazy Boy and Patches losing their pride to the brash young Angus and Scarface, and the elephant herds that made life difficult for him. They're all characters that we got to know in an extraordinary way because of Abdi Jama. When he left the United States to return to Africa, Abdi risked everything in life that he'd worked so hard for. Believing he could succeed at something he'd never experienced took an immense amount of courage and self-belief. But then for a man who started out as an impoverished camel boy and went on to become a successful businessman and then become a wildlife filmmaker, who could ever really doubt that he would succeed? Mm -hmm.